Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Sallallahu alaihi wa alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Mashallah, good to be at service. Uh, the topic tonight is on Hajj and the importance of uh, Ibrahim alayhi salam, um, one of our uh, role models, one of our greatest prophets, one of our paragons of virtue, and the sort of you know, the ibar or the lessons we can draw from what we uh, are told about Ibrahim alayhi salam in the Quran. Ibrahim alayhi salam, as I said, is one of the greatest uh, human beings uh, in the history of the human race. He's considered to be from, from the Ulul Azm min al Rusul, the five most exalted human beings. So, who are these five? Anyone know? I know there's a lot of kids here, take some Sunday school. Who are the five greatest prophets? Who knows? This is for the kids. It's family night. <laughs> Any kids know? MashaAllah. Sallallahu alayhi wa Yes. The greatest. Yes. Very good. <clears throat> What was the last one? Nuh, good, yes. So to go in chronological order, the Prophet Nuh alayhi salam, who is considered the first Rasul, he received the Sharia, the first Sharia. Uh, and then we have um, the Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam. By the way, the word Noah or Nuh, Noah in Hebrew, it means rest that God gave rest to the earth from the kufur, the infidelity that had thrived upon the earth. And then Ibrahim, does anyone know what the, the name Ibrahim means? Maybe your name is Ibrahim. You should know what your name means. <laughs> Any Ibrahims here? Ibrahim, what does your name mean? Your parents ever tell you? That's good, you just obey your parents blindly. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> Make taqlid of fiqh, but not of aqidah. So, inshallah, he's gonna. So, anyone know? Ibrahim. So, there's a verse in the Quran here. This is at the end of Surah Al Hajj, right? And of course, the Hajj is a commemoration <clears throat> of the rites that were established by Ibrahim. Salam. And this verse actually gives us a clue as to what his name means, right? So, the Hajj. Uh, is sort of our, I don't know, origin story, right? That we believe as Muslims that Ibrahim alayhi salam, he uh, traveled to the Meccan Valley, and this is where he sort of dropped off his wife, Hagar, Hajar, and Ismail alayhi salam. And then the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam is a descendant of Ismail alayhi salam. And nobody really disputes this, you know, from Ahlid Kitab. Nowadays, there, there's a lot of revisionism happening. You know what revisionism means? These are sort of people that want to make a name for themselves in different studies, usually historical studies. So they'll say really crazy things so they can get like a professorship somewhere. You know, so they'll say, for example, there's this guy, the actual Qibla was Petra, not Mecca. Okay. Or they'll say, yeah, the, uh, what is it? Um, a uh, bunch of crazy. The Quran wasn't wasn't written in the seventh century. It's from the eighth century. There's no evidence of this, right? But they have to say you know say something like that. Uh, but basically, everyone agrees. Uh, sort of a general consensus, we can say, uh, amongst historians and and people of faith. That is to say, the sort of greater sort of Abrahamic tradition, if we can call it that, Jews, Christians, and Muslims, that the Prophet sallallahu is a descendant of Ismail alayhi salam. Um, and so the Hajj has its origins in Ibrahim alayhi salam. So this ayah says, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ So strive in the, in the, uh, in the um, path of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala as you ought to strive. Okay, so this word jihad in this context means to really struggle and strive because this world is a world of uh, tribulation, that's the nature of the dunya. We have to know the nature of this world 
as Muslims, we're not meant to be too comfortable in this world. So if there's a little bit of unease, that's okay. That's completely normal. Right? Adunya uh, sijnul mu'min is a hadith of the Prophet that the world is the prison of the believer. Right? That the believer in the, in the dunya should feel a type of constriction. This is completely normal. This is healthy. Spiritually, this is healthy to feel this type of constriction. Right? Um, so, وَجَاهِدُوا فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ So keep striving. Engage in mujahada. So there are certain things that happen during our lives, right, that we should have a proper response to. We should be principled people. You know what it means to be principled? Does anyone know? Any of the youngsters here? If I told you, you should be a person of principle, what am I talking about? Okay, anyone. <laughs> Adults too. Yes, sir. You should be what? Principle means you have a clear mind that you don't talk. Very good. Yeah. This is what Sidi Faridun was saying earlier today, is that we recognize our hudud, there are parameters, that we don't transgress these hudud. Right? We stand for something. Right? To be principled means you actually stand for something, you believe in something. So one of the struggles of the modern world, right, this kind of postmodern world order that we're living in now, which is now all pervading, it's infiltrated every major institution, whether it's colleges, universities, where it's the media, workplaces, is that there is no ultimate truth. There's no such thing as ultimate truth. Or as to say, capital T, truth. Everyone has their own truth. So what's true for you may not be true for me, right? So this type of relativism. So not only theological relativism, it doesn't matter what you believe, who cares, but moral relativism. You can do anything you want, nothing really matters. You can make your own reality. It's called existentialism. We don't have essence, there's no such thing as human nature. Existence precedes essence. This is sort of one of the mantras of modern existentialist philosophers. There's no right way to be a human. There's no such thing as human nature. So you can define what a human being is, right? So whatever you are, just accept yourself and live your truth. This is, this is what's happening in the modern world right now. And I'm telling you, it's making people miserable. And in the Anglosphere, which is the English-speaking world, there's new studies done on this uh, by the World Health Organization. They found that people living in the Anglosphere, the English-speaking world, which tends to be more wealthy, more technology, there's a lot more people that, are, uh, that suffer from mental illness in the English-speaking world than any other places in the world. So it's not based on technology and wealth. What's happening in the Anglosphere? It's this type of philosophy that's pervading things, that's making, quest that's making people, young people, even question who they are. That's um, destroying definitions. People can't define things anymore. What's a human being? What's a man? What's a woman? What's beauty? What's virtue? People can't define things anymore. And what does the word definition mean? Definis. Right, towards a limit, towards a had. Even in Arabic, the word for definition is al had. That there's a parameter, there's hudud. But if you remove those hudud, then words can mean whatever you want. And you can make your own reality. So there's this type of philosophical existentialism. I believe I can do whatever I want, I can make my own reality. And then there's going to be a type of like real practical existentialism where people just, you know, they stop getting married because they can just live in the virtual world and own a virtual house, and have virtual children, right? One of the tenets of, this, of the modern world, that this sort of modern religion, whatever you want to call it, the liberal world order, the postmodern world order, is that basically, if we can do it, we should do it. Technology is king. Whatever is latest must be greatest. Whatever is latest must be greatest, right? And... Uh, if I feel like 
Um, if I feel like something is just wrong, then I must be right, if I feel it. Everything's based on feelings, right? So they'll say things like, you know, two years ago, I used to use this certain word, and now I don't use it anymore because I'm woke now. I've, I've come to a type of uh, enlightenment, right? That was two years ago. I was so crazy back then, two years ago. Well, they say, oh, in the 1950s, women in America, you know, they were so crazy. What were they doing? Look at what they're doing. They're, you know, looking after a home. Isn't that crazy? You know? I had a conversation with one of these people, and I said, there's a hadith that says, Khairu nas qarni, the best generation is the generation of the Prophet. And she said, when was that? 1400 years ago. Oh my God! 1400 years, because they believe whatever is latest is greatest. Right? So, what's latest? Well, uh, we should. Uh, not own property, we should eat bugs, we should live in pods, we should not get married, uh, we should uh, try to upload our consciousness into a cloud and then download it into a robot so we can live forever. This is what people are talking about. We can own houses in virtual reality. Okay. Uh, good luck with that world. It's a strange new world, right? There's a book by, what's his first name? His last name is Truman. I highly recommend it, called Strange New World. So check it out. But the Quran is telling us that we have to strive in this world. This world is a world of mujahada. Wajahidu fillahi haqqa jihadi. Again, this is verse 78, Surah Al Hajj. Hu ajtabakum wa ma ja'ala alaykum fi dini min haraj. He has chosen you, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, that He has chosen us and has not imposed any type of difficulties in the religion. This religion is not difficult, right? This is a simple religion, and it appeals to different walks of life, right? So, This is our theology in a nutshell. And a simple Bedouin can understand this very clearly. And then you'll have a double PhD write a dissertation on this one surah. The Quran appeals to every human being. It's a simple religion. The Prophet ﷺ said, Al halalu bayyin, wal haramu bayyin. What is illicit and illicit, or what is uh, permitted and impermissible, are both clear. Right? The Quran is clear. Kitabun mubin. It's a clear text. Let's not muddy the waters. Again, if you want a professorship, you can say, the Qur'an advocates a certain lifestyle, and here's, and here's how I'll deal with these verses. And they start going into these ayat, and taking out, uh, and extracting weird definitions of words, ignoring contexts, and ignoring wholesale other ver uh, verses. There's one of these professors, right, who says, basically, she, Muslim professor, she said that if the Qur'an says something you don't like, just say no to the text, just say no. Right? It's called radical hermeneutics. If you take an Islam 101 class in 2023 at any public university, what do you think these kids are going to learn? Five pillars, six articles of faith, Hadith Jibril? No. They're going to learn something called radical hermeneutics on day one. How do I twist and turn the Quran to be in line with my feelings rather than the other way around? I have to put myself in line with the Qur'an. This is called mujahada. But these things are lost on modern people. We have theological virtues, like humility. Humility is a good virtue. But for modern people, a lot of modern people, humility is something that's a weakness. You should not be humble. Uh, um, gratitude for us is a great virtue, theological virtue, to be grateful. But our young people, unfortunately, they're in a culture where they're, they're always constantly taught to self-victimize. I'm a victim. Woe is me. Right? And so why should I be grateful? And in, according to the Quran, the opposite of shukr is kufr. فَذْكُرُونِ أَذْكُرْكُمْ وَشْكُرُوا لِي وَلَا تَكْفُرُونَ So there's, there's this parallelism in this ayah. Right? This is very common in Semitic rhetoric, in the rhetoric of the Qur'an. I don't want to get too technical. A lot of children here. But basically, according to this ayah, 
The opposite of shukr, of gratitude, is kufur, is uh, disbelief. But if you're taught that you're a constant victim and the world is out to get you, right, because of your intersectional identity, you're brown and you're overweight and um, uh, you're ugly and <laughs> all these different things, oh, woe is me. Somebody owes me something. No. The fact that you're a Muslim in the ummah of the Prophet ﷺ, that should engender in us a type of gratitude that, you know, is off the charts. We should be basking in the glory of that, of that reality just by itself. We have no idea uh, the gift that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us. So this is important. وَجَاهِدُ فِي اللَّهِ حَقَّ جِهَادِ and he has chosen you and has not imposed in you any difficulties in the religion. Like I said, the religion is clear. There are some religions where you have to be reborn again to go to some sort of afterlife that's good. You have to be reborn over and over and over again. Right? Uh, there are some religions that you can't even get a grasp of what they're teaching. What is this? Is this some sort of philosophy? Is this an enigma? What's going on here? There's some religions that, within the religion itself, are schools of thought that are contradictory. How do you harmonize these things? So this religion is, is not difficult. Millata abikum Ibrahim. Aha. So, going back to what I mentioned earlier about the name of Ibrahim alayhi salam, that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says here that this is the millah, this is the religion, al-Islam, is the religion of Ibrahim alayhi salam. The milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam is the teaching of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. So when I talk about the greater Abrahamic tradition, you know, Jew, Judaism, Christianity, Islam, that's not the milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Our religion, al-Islam, that was brought by the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam, this is the milla of Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's not to say that these other religions don't contain truth, Certainly there's truth in Judaism, there's truth in Christianity, right? But if we're familiar with the Qur'an, and again, the Qur'an is very clear on these things, right? The Prophet ﷺ is called Al-Bayyina in the Qur'an. Al-Bayyina means the clear evidence. So we are the Milla of Ibrahim ﷺ. And this Milla is being attacked by the sort of current zeitgeist, the current spirit of the age. Right? So this is something we should understand. Millata abikum Ibrahim. It is the milla of your father Ibrahim alayhi So this is the meaning of Abraham. The meaning is the father of nations. Right? Abraham. Ab, right? Abikum Ibrahim. So here, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is not just speaking to the Arabs that are Muslim. Yes, Ibrahim alayhi salam is their progenitor, I mean, in other words, their descendants. But the middle of Ibrahim, in reality, is anyone who follows Ibrahim alayhi salam. Another way to translate uh, father is patriarch, your ruling father. Ibrahim alayhi salam is the patriarch of this religion. He called you Muslims in the past and in this, in the Qur'an. So it is our belief that all of the prophets were Muslim, right? In the sense that they submitted to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? The terms uh, like Jew and Christian, these are, these are terms that are uh, in innovated. Isa alayhi salam. Would not, call, would not have called himself a Christian. Uh, Musa alayhi salam would not have called himself a Jew. So these are Muslim prophets. But Islam was perfected with the coming of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. In order that the messenger might be a witness upon you. So the Prophet sallallahu alayhi salam is our role model. Right? So the guidance we take from him, sallallahu alaihi wasallam, is uh, sure guidance and is a dalil qat'i. It is a definitive proof of our religion. So anything that contradicts what he brought us, we reject. 
the Quran says, take whatever he brings you and uh, reject, uh, ignore whatever he um, uh, prohibits you. لِتَكُونُوا شُهَدَ عَلَى النَّاسِ And that you, in order for you to be examples for humanity. So the Prophet Wasallam is our role model. And the role of the Muslim, what are we supposed to do? We're supposed to be role models for humanity. Right? So people should look to us for guidance. And we are becoming, slowly, the sort of last bastion of traditional religion. You know, and people are starting to take notice, and people are converting to Islam. Right? A lot of people are converting to Islam these days, because they've noticed that this sort of current, you know, culture, this strange new world that we're going into, people, you know, we talk about red lines, you know, a khat ahmal, a red line for a lot of these people is their children. So if their children in kindergarten or first grade are being told strange things. That's a red line for the vast, vast majority of human beings. So they're going to start looking elsewhere. And it's interesting. It's, it's a, I don't know if you've heard about this, but there's a city in Michigan called Hamtramck. Hamtramck? Hamtramck. Hamtramck, Michigan. You heard of this city? You probably haven't heard of it because the, the, the mainstream media probably buried the story. But this city in Michigan, which is near Detroit, has a majority Muslim city council. And they voted just recently, like a week ago, two weeks ago, to ban all rainbow flags on every government building. And now Christians, and this is a, this is a blue state. There's 70% Democrats. In this state, it was a unanimous vote. You know, the flag is a, is a symbol of conquest. When you've conquered something, you, you raise your flag. Apparently, there's a flag on the moon of America. Conquered the moon. That's what it is. That's what the flag means. That's why it's on government buildings. We've conquered these lands. This is our government. Right? So, for these people that are, for these, you know, the other people in, in this city, you know, American democracy basically betrayed them. Because you have Muslims coming into the country... And this is how they voted. But then, during the vote, they made this huge spectacle. I won't tell you what they did. It's pretty shameful. Uh, just to basically anger the Muslims that were there. So in reality, our only ally is Allah and his messenger and the believers. Right? And this is the lesson we take from cities like this, where you have... Maybe you have Muslims allying themselves with, you know, different sort of groups that there's this perceived uh, perception of victimization, of oppression, and then one group comes into power, and next thing you know, uh, that allyship has broken. Why? Because I'll tell you, we have nothing, very, very little in common with this certain group of people, the, the alphabet people, the circus, whatever you want to call them. We are in completely different wavelengths. Right? So people are discovering Islam. And that's where the Muslim comes in. That we should be people of principle. Shuhada ala nas. We're role models, witnesses over humanity. To give people that alternative. So establish the prayer. It's very important that we're praying. As-salatu al-imadu al-deen. The prayer is the pillar of the religion. Bain al-kufri wal-iman tarku salah. The Prophet said in a hadith related by Imam al-Tirmidhi that between faith and disbelief is leaving the prayer. We need to establish the prayer. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us, and it's amazing these ayat in the Quran, you really see the miracle of the Quran. Why is the Quran harping on this issue of Ibrahim alayhi salam? Ibrahim alayhi salam. Because Ibrahim alayhi salam is always going to stay relevant. And he is the patriarch. You hear people today, modern people, down with the patriarchy. Who is the patriarch? Ibrahim alayhi salam. That's what they mean. Traditional religion. And traditional religion, nowadays, the epitome of traditional religion is Islam. What the Prophet brought us. You know. 
So we have to realize this. So we need to establish the prayer and give charity. وَاَعْتَسِمُوا بِاللَّهِ And hold fast to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. الْإِعْتِسَامِ That means hold tightly, as hard as you can. Hold on as, as tightly as you can to Allah. What does it mean? بِاللَّهِ Hold on tightly to Allah. Means to the guidance, the Quran and the Sunnah. Right? And don't be afraid of people. I gave a presentation in uh, Canada, and there was a young man there, and he said, I'm going to tell you something. And he said this in front of everybody. He said, I don't I think his, even his parents knew. He said that my teacher, I think he was maybe in fifth grade. So he said, my teacher took us to a movie called Buzz Lightyear. And there's a scene in this movie. I don't know if you've seen the movie. Don't watch it. Let's just say it's very disturbing. And that's the other thing. That's how they get you, right? So you watch, remember Toy Story came out in 1996? You probably saw it when you were younger, and then you had kids, and you think, hey, kids, let's watch this movie. It's a good one. It's Toy Story. It's about toys. It's for kids. Toy Story. What's wrong with that? Nothing. Let's watch it. So you watch it. Oh, you know what? There's a sequel to this, Toy Story 2. Let's watch that one. Great. Toy Story 3, it's amazing. Beautiful. And a few years go by, hey, kids, there's a... There's a prequel called Buzz Lightyear. And they've got you. Why can't we watch this one, Daddy? No, we can't. Why not? We watched all the other ones. My dad's a hypocrite. They've got you. It's over. Anyway, so he said, my teacher took us out to watch this movie, and my teacher told the whole class, don't tell your parents that we went out and watched this movie. You know, there's another student, same gathering. He said, I think he was in high school. He said there was, a, there was an assignment where we had to watch a certain movie that's completely haram. And we had to write an essay about it. So I didn't want to do it. But my teacher said, if you don't do it, you're going to get an F. Right. And then he said, he didn't really say it, but basically he hinted that he was too scared to tell his parents that he didn't want to do this, so he went ahead and did it. So that's the other thing, his parents, you know, it's not all about grades, okay? So once in a while you have to take one for the team, stand up straight, be principled. I promise you your, your child will be okay if they get a few Fs on assignments that they don't want to do, that are haram, you know? We should be understanding. The child didn't want to do it, but it seemed like he was being pressured by his teacher and parents to do this assignment. Anyway, وَعَتَسِمُ بِاللَّهُ وَمَوْلَاكُمْ So Allah is our mawla. Allah is our master. فَنِعْمَ mawla. What an excellent master, وَنِعْمَ nasir. What an excellent helper. So that's the end of Surah Al-Hajj. Right? Um, telling us that we are the millah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. Like I said, many, many verses in the Qur'an. The Qur'an is good until the end of time. Right. Many, many ayat like this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala tells us, The Jews and Christians will never ever be satisfied with you until you follow their form of religion. Right? If you were to follow, and here it's second masculine singular, so Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is speaking directly to the Prophet Muhammad, وسلم, but by extension to the Ummah. If you were to follow their ahwa, what is hawa? If you were to follow their feelings and desires and inclinations, whatever they might be, if you follow their desires, now that after knowledge has come to you, then you will find neither helper nor protector against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Allah is telling us very plainly. Right? So these ayat are clear. They're never going to be pleased with us. They're never, they're never going to have ridha with us. That doesn't mean that you know, we, uh, we have bad adab with Jews and Christians or atheists. No, we have good adab. The Prophet sallallahu had good adab with everybody, but he was a principled man. But just recently, I attended an interfaith dialogue at MCC, and, uh, you know, interfaith dialogue. You had a Muslim speaker, you had a rabbi, rabbi who was an atheist, 
atheist rabbi. You know? Jumbo shrimp. <laughs> Four-sided triangle. Um, stupid Iranian. It's, it's an oxymoron. It doesn't make any sense. <laughs> Sorry, I'm Iranian. That's why I said that last one. Uh, but this is what's happening. She says, I don't believe in any gods. Oh, you're a rabbi. Yeah. Ajib. I would think that, anyway, <laughs> I mean, breaking the first couple of commandments of the Decalogue doesn't seem like a good rabbi. But anyway, um, I think I'll stop talking at this point, maybe take some questions. I've spoken for about a half an hour. Any questions or comments, inshallah? Anything at all? Nothing? Yes, sir. So what was the meaning of Ibrahim? Yeah. Fa father of nations. The father of nations. Yes. Yeah, so it's interesting. We have, there's two groups of sort of woke people. One group is going to, wants to try to syncretize all of these major religions. So they're trying to start a religion called Abrahamia, which is basically an amalgamation of Judaism, Christianity, and Islam, right? And a lot of Muslims are falling for these tricks. There's another group that is completely trying to eradicate everything to do with Abraham. The first group tends to believe in God, right? But are not really committed to a tradition. The, the second group tend to be atheist. Either way, Ibrahim salam is totally under attack in our modern world. And the Prophet وسلم, he is upon the Millah. We're told this explicitly in the Quran. Right? So indeed, the closest of Ibrahim السلام, are those who have ittiba, who follow Ibrahim, like this Prophet, the Prophet وسلم, and those who believe, the Sahaba and the Ummah of the Prophet Muhammad وسلم. Right? <clears throat> so he's a progenitor of many nations, but the guidance that was brought by the Prophet وسلم, is a recapturing, a restoration of that true millah. And this is the millah that's being attacked in our modern world. Yes? So given the uh, lack of guardrails and, and truth with a big T in the world that you're seeing today, what advice would you give for parents with young kids, or, or young kids are you know, about to marry and have kids, and how to live in the society. Do we, do we separate? Do we just put them in you know, homeschool and Islamic schools and, and kind of take them away from the society? Or is there a way to be part of the society? And throw, I mean, and I'll give you a data point, like the, the school my kids went to, mm. now they have the, the, you know, the flag you mentioned. Oh, everywhere. It's yeah, everywhere. So it's everywhere. Yeah. So, and how do you explain that? How do you rationalize that with the kids? So, any, any thoughts I'd appreciate? Yeah, I mean, separation is always an option. Maybe even hijrah is an option. Uh, isolation. There are, there are Jewish communities in New York that don't even speak English. They just speak you know, Hebrew and Yiddish. They live in America. They don't have internet on their phones, right? That's obviously sort of a, an extreme example. You have Christians living in the um, middle of the country called the Amish. <laughs> uh, you know, some of them don't speak English, it's just German, Pennsylvania Dutch. They reject all technology. They have horse and buggies. They don't even have zippers. I think zippers are good. I don't think zippers is a bit out, by the way. I think they got that one wrong. <laughs> but that's an option that Jews and Christians in this country have exercised. Now, you might say, well, like, I can't do that. Well, you know, it's, it's up to the individual person. I mean, I think we have to be honest with ourselves. You know, it's, it's difficult to be honest with yourself. Uh, but, you know, to, to preserve the tradition, we have to watch over the children. So if you have a dual income family, maybe one of the parents should think about educating the child in, in the house, homeschooling the child. You're not going to make 
uh, as much money, but what's your akhirah worth? You know, if you can sort of avoid public schools, I would do it at all costs. Um, you know, some parents maybe can start a, a co-op, or like I said, homeschooling is an option. Um, because it's, it's, it's all pervading now. It's poisonous and it's everywhere. And like I said, many times, most times probably, children won't even tell their parents what's happening in school because they're told explicitly by their teachers not to tell your parents. Uh, so, you know, we have to make drastic changes in some, in some cases. Um, and we're all in the same boat, you know. It's not like anyone's immune to this. Um, but education is the key. I think educating your children uh, in uh, our theology, in the liberal arts, is very important. The trivium. You know, people don't study these things. So they're persuaded oftentimes by sophistry. So in other words, sophistry is basically speech that just kind of sounds good, right? So, you, you know, you want to be tolerant, don't you? Have tolerance. Be kind. Coexistence. The same people who spout these, uh, these, um, these mantras tend to be the most intolerant of people, right? Which is ironic. Um, so, you know, it's, it's a difficult situation. But, you know, when, when that happened in that city, in, in, I, can't, I, don't, I can't even pronounce the name, in, uh, in, in Michigan, you have all these Christians in red states going, why are we such cowards? You have these Muslims that came over from the Middle East and they got on the city council and they voted to get rid of this flag and they did it. Why can't we do that? Why are we such cowards? It was really, it was really interesting. <laughs> Why don't we stand up for ourselves? How come these Muslims have this istiqamah? Because the guidance is clear. Right? So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you know, you know, Islam will prevail, but Muslims come in and out. But Islam will stay. You know, so nobody is safe. Don't think for a second, I'm safe. I'm good enough. It'll be okay. We have to be in a constant state of mujahada and constantly in a state of trying to purify our intentions, purify the nafs, the lower self. Because, you know, tribulations are coming up. It's going to become difficult. There's going to be tests of iman in the next decade, two decades with the rise of technology, AI, things like this. Uh, there's, you know, further divides. You know, people don't want to get married anymore. People, you know, a lot of young people think, a lot of men think women are the enemy and vice versa. It's very strange. Even from when I was, you know, in the 90s, it's completely different. Even five, six years ago, it's a completely different world. The culture has changed so rapidly. What's, what's it going to be like in 10, 15, 20 years? So certainly, you know, take measures to, to safeguard the dean, whatever that might be. Yeah, I mean, you should. The, the Prophet sallallahu alaihi wasallam, he said, "Al Khalilu ala dini, uh, al Maru ala dini Khalili," that a person is upon the religion of their friends. So, you know, I have a lot of non-Muslim acquaintances and kind of, you know, kind of congenial, sort of light friendships, but I'm not really close with, you know, these people. You know, I'm not going to leave my kid at their house for a birthday party. You know, so. You know, we can be friendly with people, we can have sort of light relationships, but you know, who you embrace as a friend, you should be very, very discriminatory. You should discriminate. Yes, I said it. <laughs> discriminate between people. <laughs> I tell people I practice discrimination and they say, oh, how dare you? I'm also a sexist, by the way. I treat men and women differently. Yeah, of course I do. You know, so they want, they want to label us with their own definitions. They want to use their own terms on us and for us to submit to them. Like this one guy, he said to me, you're a cis male. So what does that mean? You don't know what cis means? No. 
I don't accept that word. In fact, to me, that word is a, uh, a, a slur, a, het a heterosexual slur. You've offended me. Oh, I didn't mean to offend you. To play their own game against them. Right? But we have a worldview, and we should be proud of that worldview. And uh, it suffices us, because for us, the, you know, the, the akhirah, it takes priority over the dunya. Like I said, this dunya, dunya literally means the low world. It's fleeting, it's temporary, it's not worth selling out, right? So, I would just, to answer your question, be, be especially discriminatory, uh, even amongst our own community. That's part of living in the dunya. It's very difficult. Yes, sir. Maybe a follow up to the other question. What kind of advice do you have for the children? Ah. Uh, advice for the children. Children, if you go to a public school and your teacher is saying to do something that you don't feel comfortable with doing, um, you can tell your teacher, I don't feel comfortable. And don't let the teacher force you into doing anything that you don't feel comfortable with. And you should come home and tell your parents about it. It's very important that you communicate to parents, to your parents. Your parents, even though sometimes it doesn't seem like it, they only want what's good for you, I promise you. Okay, I promise you, they only want what's good for you. So even something like, you know, I want, okay, well, yesterday I wanted a cookie for dessert. And my mom said, no, isn't that good for me? My mom said, no, it's good because cookies are unhealthy. Maybe you had a cookie earlier. So two cookies, very unhealthy. So at the end of the day, your parents know exactly what they're doing. Okay, so that should be your, your opinion of your parents. Trust your parents. Okay, respect your teachers. But it, may, it might be that your teacher does not really... Uh, know what's good for you as a person, like your mother or father. So don't feel like you're forced into doing anything. And if something does happen, if somebody asks you a weird question or something like that, you should go home and ask your and, and tell your parents about that. Okay. Anyway, I I, I had a few examples come into my head, but like, I'm not going to say them. <laughs> Maybe later, inshallah. Um, the, the thing is, I would let children be children, you know, um, it's going to happen organically, um, you know, don't, I would try to preserve a child's innocence as much as possible, right, and eventually I think a child will come to the parent uh, at some point and say, I heard this or I saw this, what does this mean, and then we can explain it to them, but being sort of, you know, being sort of proactive in the sense that explaining something to a child that um, is inappropriate for them at a certain age. Maybe, you know, some, some children are more precocious and, you know, they're sort of more, they can deal with certain things like that. You know your child well. You can be the judge of that. Uh, but make sure that, you know, we're not introducing them to things that is inappropriate for them. Try to preserve your child's innocence as much as possible. And what's happening in, in public schools is exactly the opposite of that. I mean, kindergarten. Children in kindergarten, isolating the boys. Who feels like a girl today? And the, and the, the, first, the first time the children are asked, it's their fitrah. And it's just like, what? what? What is this insane person saying right now? That's the initial reaction of a five-year-old child from fitrah. Come on, you can tell us. You ever play dress up and wear your sister's clothes? That's what they're being asked. And then eventually, what about you? Do you do it? And they feel pressure. You do it, right? Yeah. How about you? Yeah. All right. It's all manipulation. There was someone who came into a masjid years ago, and I said, I quoted a hadith, you know, one of these, these wokies came into the masjid, and I said, I said, there's a hadith that says, <laughs> there's a hadith that says, أَدِّبُوا أَوْلَادُكُمْ عَلَىٰ فَلَاثِ خِشَارِ Discipline your children upon three things. حُبُّ نَبِيِّكُمْ 
the love of your Prophet and the love of the family of the Prophet and upon the reading of the Quran. So discipline your children, teach your children to love the Prophet. And this person raised their hand in the back. They woke you. And they said, I don't know if it was a man or a woman, that's why I say today. I guess it was a man. I couldn't tell, honestly. He said, isn't that manipulative? Aren't you being manipulative? So what's, what's manipulative? You're teaching a child to love someone? That's what, what does manipulation mean? The word manipulation comes from manus, which means hand. So if manipulating something means to mold something with your hand. And of course, children need to be molded by their parents because the intellect uh, is, is lacking with children. They need to be manipulated. So the question is, whose manipulation is in the child's best interest? Your manipulation, what you're asking children at five years old, what you're asking them to believe in, or what I'm doing? Let's have a discussion. No, I don't want to have a discussion. They don't want to have a discussion. As soon as you say something like, is it really a good idea uh, to give children hormone therapy at 10 years old? How dare you? There's no discussion. It's just how dare you. They don't want to talk. They're, they don't want to. They don't want to reason, right? It used to be, you should tolerate us. Just tolerate us. So, lokum dina kum Okay, we'll tolerate. And then it was, you should accept us. You know, give us a nod. You don't have to join the parade, but give us the thumbs up from a distance. And now it's, if you don't join our parade and celebrate us, then you're a bigot and you're this and you're that and. That's what, that's what happened. And so a lot of Muslims in the West are thinking, I don't want to be called a bigot. So uh, maybe we should think about joining these people somehow and supporting them. You know. But it's a mistake. There's only one life. You know. What about Allah's opinion? The only opinion that matters is the opinion of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So don't fear the men. Don't fear the men. Don't fear humanity. Don't fear mankind. Fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Right? Why are these other religions selling out? Because they fear people. They fear human beings. They're being afraid. They're afraid of losing tax exemption status. They're afraid of losing dunya. They're afraid of being canceled on social media. So they sell out their principles and lose their akhirah. And then they try to justify it. To, no, it's okay. This verse means this, this verse means that. Forget about this verse, sweep this verse under the rug over here. Don't look at this, nothing to see here. You know. Anyway. All right. Yes, sir. Yeah, definitely. I mean, we're really not right or left. Maybe sort of right of center. Because we are more conservative. You know, we believe in tradition, traditional family values, you know. Uh, we believe in truth with a capital T. We have, we believe in traditional morality. So those are things that we have in common with, with conservatives, right? That doesn't necessarily make us Republicans. <laughs> You know, so like one time I gave a talk somewhere and I mentioned these things and somebody said, so you support Trump, huh? So why, why would you say that? Because I said I'm against abortion. So that's, that's, that's your, I mean, talk about a non-secretor argument, right? So no, we're neither right nor left. And you have, and people are becoming extreme in this religion. I mean, even the center is, is crumbling. And it's all in reaction to each other. 
So you have now you have the extreme woke left, right? That wants to basically destroy everything that's traditional, destroy every type of hierarchy, just level humanity, start all over again. You have these like young people shaking their fists at thousands of years of tradition, thinking they know better, right? And then you have now the extreme sort of MAGA on the other side. So this side saying we need to have gay mosques. Over here at the extreme, they're saying no more mosques. We, we don't fit in either camp. You know? Your only ally is Allah and his messenger and the believers. That's it. And people come in and out of the religion, Allah and his messenger. You know, when the Sahaba returned from Uhud, there was a munafiq in Medina who said, The people are gathering against you, so be afraid of them. Right? Just like right now, the people, the Nas, are gathering against us, attacking our tradition, attacking our religion, attacking our morality, attacking our theology, attacking our children, crossing these red lines. What did the Sahaba say according to the Quran? It only increased their iman when they heard that. Uh, and they said, Allah is sufficient for us. He is the best disposer of affairs. So that level of iman, you know. <clears throat> Any questions over here? Yes. Repeat what? Repeat the Hajj? Oh, briefly. Oh, briefly. You mean the topic of my lecture <laughs> that I never that I never talk about? <laughs> yes, yes. So yes, the Hajj is the fifth pillar of Islam. And the Hajj is pilgrimage to Mecca. MashaAllah. If you can make a pilgrimage to Mecca, the prices are pretty crazy. But if Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala gives you tawfiq, and we should intend it every year, even if you don't think, because you never know. There are people that up until like the day before Dhul Hijjah, <laughs> they're thinking, yeah, I'm not, not going to Hajj. And somebody sponsors them, the next day they're on a the plane. So, um, so it's, it's something that we should do if we can afford to do so once, once in our life to, to make Hajj, to visit the Kaaba in Mecca. And the Prophet Sallallahu he said, whoever makes the Hajj and is accepted from Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala, then it is as if he was born anew from his mother's womb, meaning all of his sins are forgiven, like a newborn baby, no more sins, right? And it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful rite. They, they rarely show it on on television in the West because they know it's a very powerful image. You would think a gathering of two million people from all over the world would be front page news. No, it's nothing. They never show it, you know. Um, and there's, you know, there's reasons for that. And if we can uh, manage to uh, visit the Prophet Sallallahu in Medina and give our salams to the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, this is uh, a beautiful thing to do, make ziyara of the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So that's what it is. That's what the Hajj is. And the Hajj, as we said, the, the Kaaba uh, was actually built. The, the foundations, according to the ulama, the, the scholars, the foundations of the Kaaba were laid down by the Prophet Adam, السلام, the first human being. And then the walls uh, initially were uh, raised by Ibrahim السلام, and Ismail, السلام, who are two prophets. These are ancestors of the Prophet Muhammad. السلام. And so we make tawaf around the Baytullah, the Kaaba is also called Baytullah, the house of God. We make circumambulations. This is the sunnah of Ibrahim alayhi salam. It's the sunnah of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi salam. And even some Bani Israel uh, were told, also visited uh, Mecca um, during the times of Dawood alayhi salam, Suleiman alayhi salam. There seems to be a reference to the Kaaba in the book of Psalms, Allahu alam. Uh, and then uh, there's different rites that we perform. During the Hajj, like the stoning of the Shaitan, which is when Shaitan came to Ibrahim السلام, and told him not to go through with what Allah had commanded him, and he picked up seven stones and threw them at the Shaitan. 
to remind us also, shaitan is an enemy. Innahu lakum aduum mubin. You know, we talk about shaitan nowadays, people start going, oh, what? do you believe in Satan? Are you kidding me? In this day and age, I had a Muslim one time say this to me, in this day and age, brother? I said, bro, have you read the Quran? Of course. Okay. <laughs> no, he didn't. How many times? 15 times? 20 times? Innahu lakum aduum mubin. He is a clear enemy to you, shaitan. Right. And now we live in a time when shaitan is openly worshipped, openly praised. They had Satan Khan. They have a conference celebrating Satan uh, in Boston just like a month ago. They're claiming it's the largest gathering of Satanists in the history of the world. Uh, what was the opening act? Somebody got up there and started tearing up the Bible. This book advocates misogyny, hom homophobism, hom uh, homophobism? Homophobia. homophobia and uh, patriarchy and blah 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 blah. Slavery. Tear it up. You know? And a lot of those, you know, a lot of these ideas, I mean the, the Bible is a book that promotes traditional theology, morality, objective truth. Those things are found in the Quran. Do you think they like the Quran? Of course not. But what, is, what do these Satanists actually believe? Many of them are atheists. They don't actually believe in Satan. So many of them actually, they call themselves Satanists, but Satan is more like a symbol. He's not a real person. What does Satan symbolize? The worship of the nafs. This is what they say. Worship of the hawa. And this is a very, very common form of idolatry nowadays. Everybody worships something. We don't buy into atheism. There's no such thing as an atheist. The Quran doesn't entertain atheism. Somebody, everyone worships something. Have you seen the one who takes his hawa as his god? That's his god. He worships his hawa. You know. So, that's what it is. Uh, so even like, you know, movies and things like that, these things have to be screened now. I mean, I, I highly recommend before, before your child watches a G-rated movie that you watch it beforehand. This is, what, this is how we have to live now. You know, because there's subliminal messages. There's things in the background. I saw this movie recently. There was this thing in the background. You know, and the children are like, hey, what's wrong? It's a cartoon. What's wrong with it? It's a cartoon. Come on. My dad is so strict. We have to explain these things to people. Explain things, you know, these things in a calm manner with adab and try to impart upon the child the importance of or the dangers of these types of things. Basically, anything Disney, you have to be careful. <laughs> yes? So my, my thing you mentioned about the Quran, the Allah is the best for everybody, adults and children, and one twenty and Baba. Oh. Say to everybody what you're supposed to do. I think you mentioned that they should go and do whatever they drink and go have a hope to God. Yeah. You are by yourself. Everybody might have to go to it. Hmm. Yeah, 120 Baqarah. This ayah. Yeah, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling us the reality of the situation. You know. So. The lesson is to have uprightness in the religion. Have istiqamah. Fastaqim. Fastaqim kama umirt, as the Quran says. Be upright as you have been commanded. And don't worry about, you know, like I said, about the feelings of people. Don't try to intentionally hurt people's feelings. But the opinion of Allah, every single time, is more important than anyone's feelings. Okay. Um, so the Prophet وسلم, said to one of his companions say I believe in Allah and be upright have istiqamah stand up straight and don't be afraid of people who reproach you don't be afraid وَلَا تَخَفِ اللَّهِ لَوْمَ تَلَائِمْ يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَا يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمٍ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ 
أذلة على المؤمنين أعزة على الكافرين يجاهدون في سبيل الله ولا يخافون لوم تلائم ذلك فضل الله يؤتيه من يشاء والله واسع عليم O you who believe if you turn away from this religion Allah will bring a new people that he loves and they love him lowly with the believers but having strictness against hostile unbelievers being principled the, un the unbelievers see them as having a type of dignity uh and they're not afraid of those who approach them for their religion. So the ulama say, this, in their tafsir of this ayah, why did these people leave the religion? Based on this ayah, because they didn't have the proper love of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That's why he loves them and they love him. And then why are they not afraid of those who approach them? Because they have rational arguments. They have academic sophistication. They can defend their religion with clarity, with coherence. Right? This idea again of the trivium. What is the trivium? Teach your children these three arts. They're called the liberal arts. But liberal, I don't mean left wing. Liberal meaning the freeing arts. They free your mind. What are they? Logic. How do you, how do you think properly? Uh, um, grammar. How do you speak properly? And write properly? And rhetoric? How are you persu persuasive? The Prophet ﷺ was the most uh, eloquent of human beings. He never made grammatical errors, and he was the clearest thinking human being. He was a master of these arts. Otherwise, it's sophistry. It's just persuasion for the sake of persuasion, because I feel this. I, I, this is what I feel. And if you don't feel it, then you're canceled. But what about Allah canceling you? We don't want to be canceled by Allah, right? Because that's the real cancellation. There's no coming back from that cancellation. You know, if, 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 uh, what are these? I don't, can't even think right now. Facebook, no. Instagram cancels you. <laughs> Maybe they'll let you back, right? After you do your penance and uh, your repentances and, uh, and your groveling and, but if we get canceled by Allah, we're in trouble. So, but the thing about Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is he is a tawab, which means he is constantly willing to forgive us if we make tawbah. Right? So be in a state of tawbah. But if you know if you're if you're not recognizing that what you're doing is sinful, then you'll never make tawbah. And this again is something that the modern culture is teaching children that you need to just accept who you are and nothing you're doing is really wrong because there's no objective, there's no objective truth and falsehood. Nothing you're doing is really wrong in reality. It's actually wrong. So there's no need to make Toba. And if you cut off Toba, then we're in trouble. Last question. It's time. Well, Yes. Yes. The question is, do I know about the about Prophet Ibrahim alayhi salam sacrificing Ismail alayhi salam? Yeah. So Allah subhanahu wa taala was testing Ibrahim alayhi salam. Allah did not want Ibrahim to, to actually sacrifice his son. Right. So the, the test was to see if Ibrahim السلام, is willing to put Allah above and everything, even above his children, because a person loves their children more than anything, more than themselves. Right? So he passed the test. When Allah said, uh, when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, um, told Ibrahim to stop, he said, Qad sadaqta ru'ya. You've, you've already been true to your vision. You've already fulfilled your vision. In other words, the, the intention of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was not to actually have him sacrifice his child, but be willing to make the ultimate sacrifice. To demonstrate his love for Allah greater than anything, anything else. That's the lesson we take from the story. You know, you know Christians take a different lesson. <clears throat> but we don't take that lesson. <laughs> Yeah. 
How do Jews and Christians differ in their understanding of Prophet Ibrahim, his significance and meaning in our lives today? Yeah, so, I mean, traditionally it's, it's, it's very similar to our understanding of Ibrahim Ali Salam. He is the, the father of the tradition. Um, he's sort of the, the quintessential monotheist, right? Um, a paragon of virtue. Um, but, it, I mean, it depends on, nowadays it depends on what, I mean, it's hard to find a traditional Christian anywhere now. I work in Berkeley, and I talk to Christians in Berkeley, and they believe in things that would have them anathematized from the church. I mean, you have the Pope saying things that are very strange, which, according to many Catholics, I mean, he's, he's said things that are cool for According to many Catholics, this is a Pope. So who knows what they, you know, I mean, there was somebody who told me earlier that, and I've heard this before from modern rabbis, that Ibrahim teaches us that we can debate with God, that we don't have to listen to him, we can debate with him. And we can ask God, you know, uh, what do you mean by that? And, you know, no, I'm not going to do that. So this is, this is sort of the lesson that some, some of the, the modern rabbis are taking and teaching their congregations about the story of Ibrahim Ali Salam. Um, and then Christians sort of see Abraham as more like typological, like what he's doing with Isaac is more sort of foreshadowing of what's going to happen with Isa Ali Salam and things like that. Um, but traditionally it was, it was, and I think this is true to a certain extent as well, is that they see him as the father of the tradition and uh, a virtuous monotheist, a true monotheist. And the Quran is very explicit about that. Well, it's Maghrib time, inshallah. Jazakallah khairan. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala bless us. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala um, Accept the Hajj of those who are coming back from the Holy Lands. Please keep us in your prayers. Assalamu alaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh.